Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to the second annual Humanities Podcast uh, Network Symposium. Um, and welcome to the plenary session. Um, I'm just going to say a few words. Oh, hi, everyone. Yeah, oh, Missouri, London. Awesome. So I'm going to just say uh, a couple words just about like, you know, the organizational aspect of it. And um, just that, you know, we are a looking to kind of break down a little bit more of the hierarchical aspects of kind of the normal academic um, conference. Um, we are looking for participation um, and we're so happy that everyone is super excited to come in and participate in the conversation. Um, we're going back to, you know, this idea of orality and how knowledge creation and sharing is shared through voice and how the humanity aspect of it and the full embodied aspect of it comes back so that we're not just sharing ideas through almost like a detached page, but we're like fully in it and we could see each other speak to speak these ideas, exchange these ideas and not just like, and create new ones in the moment. Um, but I will pass it on to my other colleagues that are help organize this as well. Um, and yes, again, we are looking for your participation as well. This is not just um, sitting and listening, but like it's all about dialogue. It's all about an exchange. And we're really happy that everyone is uh, here today. So. Thanks. Um, so yeah, the, my name is Avon McMaster and I'm one of the co-organizers and a member of the HPN. I've been signing us as executive on your emails, but that is not an official thing. It's just, I had to figure some collective noun for us. Um, we'll talk more about this later in this session, but I just want to point out that the HPN is a loose organization of people who are interested in giving the time to do something in the HPN. So when I say executive, it's not like it's voted on. I'm in this group because I was rather vocal last time, last year about wanting to participate. And now I am. So there you are. <laughs> so we'll use that as a model. Um, I am just wanted to talk a little bit about the other platform we're using for this session, uh, the Gather Space, which is an informal, a uh, couple of you may have tried it out, but it's an informal space. Uh, you'll notice that it looks like an 8-bit video game. Um, it's a place for you to go in between sessions if you'd like, or during sessions if you want to talk to someone instead, to carry on the conversations that happen in the sessions. Uh, it's open and easy to access and walk around in and talk to people in groups or, you know, one on one. It is also where the posters are. So please feel free to hang out there anytime during these two days. Uh, they'll probably, if there isn't a session going on, there'll probably be one of us there just if you want to chat or ask any questions. And during the poster sessions, you can go in there to interact with the people who wanted to uh, share their podcasts or other projects with you. So please, uh, and all, all you need is either a browser or a mo mobile connection. It's very, very simple. And I'll pass it on to Milan. Thanks. Um, so my name is Milan Terlunen, um, and I just want to second Avon's, um, you know, plug for the gather space. It's fun, and it really is a way to have kind of conversations that I don't think are totally possible over Zoom. Um, so yeah, really recommend joining that whenever you have some free time. Um, so I'm just gonna talk briefly about the sort of the scheduled sessions um, and the format that we came up with um, and the motivation behind that. So um, we, as Dan was saying, we really want this to be conversational and interactive. And um, so for that reason, we've planned these sessions so that um, at least half of each session is you know, free open discussion um, with anyone who's in attendance. Um, so the second half of each session um, is over to everyone who has something to say. Um, but each session will also have uh, several leaders who will start the session off, introduce themselves, um, maybe talk a bit about their own podcast projects and experience. Um, and kind of get the conversation started. So um, hopefully we have a nice balance of sort of, um, you know, some people that really know about and care about the topic, introducing it, but then it's also really over to everyone that that wants to, uh, you know, weigh in, ask a question, share their own experiences. Um, 
So that is the format that you can expect from all of the sessions on the schedule. Um, and with that, um, I'm gonna hand over to Beth Kramer, who is going to present um, what is to date, I think the most uh, impressive and substantial resource that HBN has produced. Um, so Beth, over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, we're really excited to be here. My name's Beth Kramer. I've been chairing the HBN teaching committee this year. And we thought what we would do is talk to you about one of the resources we've developed um, that we've been working on a teaching manual for teaching students to podcast. So I just wanted to introduce um, some of the contributors that are gonna talk on the panel today. Um, so we have Uli Bear from NYU, um, Robin Davies from Vancouver Island University, and Eric Detweiler from Middle Tennessee State University, and Harley Ramsey from USC. So we're really excited to be here. I'll tell you just very briefly how we're gonna organize just the beginning of the conversation today. And then we're gonna move into a, a general discussion about HPN resources. Um, so this manual, the idea for it kind of came out of last year's symposium. Um, and we realized a lot of us had really interesting, diverse experience teaching students to podcast. And it'd be great to bring those together into a resource that um, educators could use both at the high school and even, um, even the high school level and also the college level. So um, in today's presentation, we're just gonna talk to you about our contributions to the manual, the way that the manual is organized. And I'm gonna put in the chat a brief excerpt, which is a sample of the manual, just so that you get a sense of how it's organized and, and what, it, um, what its possibilities are. Our, the beginning is um, sort of a background on the different skills that you need to teach students to podcast. And then each of us contributed a lesson plan that was based on our own experience. Um, so we're gonna just talk for five minutes each or so about our own lesson plan. And one of the great things about being able to discuss it with you in this panel format is that we could share some student samples or talk about some of the things that kind of extend beyond the manual itself. Um, we're also looking for feedback since this is in kind of its initial stages and we're hoping to publish it by the end of the year. So we're trying to figure out the best format for it. So we're very interested um, in hearing your feedback. Um, so feel free to give us some suggestions throughout um, in the chat. And we're hoping to have a little time for Q&A directly about the manual after. We'll ask you some direct questions about usability. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric Detweiler who's gonna kick us off talking about his section of the manual. All right, th uh, thanks so much, Beth. And yeah, thank you again, everybody for being here today. Um, I'll say good morning from, from Nashville, Tennessee on my part. Um, so I'm an associate professor uh, and director of the public writing and rhetoric program at Middle Tennessee State University. Uh, I've been making teaching and researching podcasts for about a decade now. Um, and my section of the manual focuses on a class I've been teaching since uh, I think 2017, if my memory is, is right there. Um, and that is called Rhetoric and Recorded Sound. It's an upper division English elective um, that moves students through a series of audio exercises and readings from both the field of rhetoric and writing studies, as well as sound studies, uh, ultimately building to a collaborative sort of thematically linked podcast produced by the entire class with students working in groups of about three to five uh, to create individual episodes in that series. Um, so I'm going to talk about my section kind of from a couple angles here. Um, first, I'll touch a little bit on the content of the course and, and my section itself. Um, I hope for many of you, especially those of you who weren't here last year when those of us on this panel talked a little bit about this stuff, um, that this will prove useful for your courses. But I also want to talk about how my section is organized. Um, as Beth mentioned, one of the big things we'd love feedback on at this point is um, sort of readers want from this manual and how we can move forward and structure it in a way that will be useful to readers. So I'll bounce back basically a little bit uh, between uh, content and form. Um, I'm going to drop in the chat here a link to a Dropbox folder that I've set up. Um, and there's a few different things uh, in there. One, probably the most immediate thing of interest is uh, just a PDF of my section of the manual. So you all can get a sense of what that looks like. Uh, so if you just look in that folder for the document entitled manual section, that's what's there. Uh, there's a few other things too that I'll just run through real quick. So there, 
there's a document called syllabus, which is just the syllabus for one iteration of the course I'm talking about. Um, exercise prompts, which are the prompts for the series of audio exercises students do. There's one that's just called article, which is a more conventional kind of scholarly article where I dig into those exercises in a little more detail. Um, and then I've got a series of, of sample um, student projects from that course shared with their permission. So a couple uh, of an interview project I have them do where they make and edit and cut down an, an audio interview, a couple narrative pieces where they just kind of have to narrate a story from their everyday life, uh, and then one soundscape that they make uh, as, as part of the projects for that course. Um, so overall, and I'll, I'll click over and share my screen here real quick. Um, I'm not going to sort of read through, of course, my entire section, um, but I just want to kind of use this as a template to sort of scroll through and like I said, talk about a little bit what's in this section as well as how it's put together. Um, so I took a narrative approach, just kind of walking the reader through the context for the course and how it unfolds over the semester. Um, this is not universal to this section, you know, or to this guide. Some of us, and you may hear this from other presenters, started kind of with a quick head note about a course or an activity we do, and then sort of move pretty quickly to dropping in materials like assignment prompts and so on from those courses. Um, one of the things we've been thinking about as a team is sort of how much readers might want those kind of course materials integrated directly into the body of the manual versus how much they might be useful as kind of like an appendix sort of at the end. Um, my instinct was to go more the narrative route, but that's definitely not the only way we do or could proceed here. Um, so in the first part, essentially, I try to provide an overview and a little bit of the institutional context for this course, uh, you know, how it speaks to and fits in with departments and programs across my campus, speaks to our particular student body. Um, I've also dropped in the course description from the syllabus, uh, which is the one thing I will pause and just read real quick here for context. So this is just the description of the syllabus and kind of that we circulate uh, when promoting the course uh, about this class. In this course, students will study recorded sound and produce their own recordings as well as writings about sound. Course texts will include readings about the history, theory, and practice of rhetoric, as well as podcast episodes and readings from the field of sound studies. Major projects will include a student-produced podcast series, pieces of reflective writing, and audio exercises. Along the way, students in the course will consider the following questions. What are the rhetorical effects, possibilities, and limitations of recorded sound, and how do they compare to the effects, possibilities, and limitations of writing? What makes for effective communication when it comes to recorded sound? What is recorded sound's relationship to accessibility, copyright issues, and social change? And how might we think, how might recorded sound, which has only been around for about 150 years, change the ways we think about rhetoric and writing, which have been around for millennia, and vice versa? Um, so that's kind of the context, broadly speaking, for this class. Um, so again, kind of in terms of organization, from that initial overview, I move into a section on assessment. Um, I think there could be a case for maybe saying a little less here, but for me, I find assessment to be one of the key challenges of doing digital and kind of multimedia projects and humanities classes. Um, for example, often these are asking students to do new things with new technologies rather than like building on, you know, certain skills that they've developed, like in the intro courses for a major or something like that. You know, my case with English majors, they may have been doing literary analysis in written form across five courses for years and years. But they may have never messed with a with a you know an uh, audio recording ever, other than just like listening to audio. Um, so one of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about is like how can I make sure that when I'm assessing student work, you know, I'm not giving an automatic leg up to the student who you know is a double major in audio engineering and has you know thousands of dollars worth of audio equipment in their in their you know apartment or dorm room versus the student who's like just clicking record for the first time. Um, and so for me that takes the form of a sort of portfolio based kind of ungrading assessment approach called the learning record, um, which I've used in a lot of different classes for a number of years at this point. Um, but again, this is one of those places for us putting the manual together where there's a question of like, how much would a sort of appendix or subsection on assessment kind of dedicated to that make sense? versus how much does that help to sort of encounter it in the context of these courses um, in these individual sections. Um, 
From there, I move on into sort of what we read and listen to in the course, you know, sort of the podcasts, episodes, the readings that students do across the semester as kind of models for what podcasting might be and what they can do with those projects, as well as the, some of those more theoretical kind of background and framework for the class. And there's some examples of some of the things I assign there. Um, and then I jump into how students initially learn to work with audio. Um, I talked just a little bit about um, technology here. So I use Audacity, which I know many instructors do because it's an, an open source, you know, free um, digital audio editing program. Um, again, one of those places where like we, we've kind of offloaded tech um, to kind of one section of the manual in part because it turns over so fast that it can get obsolete super quickly on um, that kind of advice. Uh, but also because, you know, in some ways we don't necessarily need to repeat that in every section if some of us have similar workflows. Um, so that's, that's one of the things we've tried so far to kind of centralize somewhere else. Um, and then from there, once I get through that and I kind of talk through the exercises that I have students do, trying to break down podcasting and the different workflows involved there into kind of manageable chunks that let them practice different kinds of this work rather than asking them to do it all at once. We'll talk about that for a bit. Uh, and then from there, you'll see I talk about how they plan the podcast project they do as a class. Um, a lot of stuff kind of about like, how does project management work? How do I structure class time? Um, how do we flip from kind of a more like discussion oriented to almost studio space with what we do in the classroom in the latter parts of the semester? Um, and then I end just with a little bit on how they actually make the project. You know, once they've set the theme, come up with the episodes they want to make, how do they go about actually creating that? file management, some of the nuts and bolts like that, um, and then sort of what we do at the end of the semester to give them a chance to encounter students' work. Um, so, you know, of course, you are welcome to continue um, reading through and looking at this section over the course uh, of the rest of this session, um, but I just wanted to give that kind of quick overview to give you a sense of what's going on there. Um, I will drop two more things real quick in the chat before I wrap up. One is just a link um, to my website. I have a teaching page there that has sort of some more um, pedagogical materials and things like that. If you're interested in some more context for, for the way I approach other kinds of digital media courses and some graduate level sound studies courses. Um, and then finally, I will also just drop my email address there. So if you want to follow up with any of this kind of one-on-one, -on -one, um, I'm more than happy to, to continue the conversation via email. Uh, but with that, I will stop and turn it over to uh, Harley Ramsey, who's been another key part of the team. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, I'm attempting to screen share. Was I successful? Okay, great. So um, like Eric, I've been teaching podcasting in the classroom since 2017. Uh, and a lot has happened <laughs> in those five years in terms of our students' awareness of podcasting. Um, I happen to teach um, engineering students. So I teach a GE course on communication. So this is approaching humanities for STEM students. So they may have a little bit less awareness um, than some other student populations. So what's changed in the last five years, I should actually just give you the uh, slick view here, <laughs> not with my notes. We all know what's changed. Our students know what podcasting is. Five years ago, only half my students might have known what a podcast was. Um, and now, um, just this last week, I played some uh, podcasts for my students, and they said, wait, her hook was too long. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you guys have a sense of um, expectation and um, critical um, vantage point. So with that, my contribution to the manual is a one-day lesson plan. Um, and that lesson plan is focused on genre. Uh, it's typically how I introduce the podcast assignment to my students. So with my lesson plan, I also include uh, my grading rubric and a storyboard because those are things I incorporate into the discussion of genre, which I'll get to at the end of, you know, just four minutes. Um, but also those are um, contextualizing documents for the students. So why genre? Why genre now? Well, for the reason I just said, students are now savvy consumers of podcasts, but they haven't stopped and thought about how they're built. How do they work? So this is having them first move from listener and consumer to creator and like, what are the pieces of the podcast? Um, and so I have a great article 
from Christopher Drew on educational podcast genre, where he demonstrates and um, gives examples of the rhetorical moves of different genres. Uh, and so students find that very helpful if they could identify the moves. Um, and this is you know, ultimately um, empowering to them as creators. Um, so I stress to my students that creating the podcast is an iterative process. And I would say my teaching of podcasting is iterative also. So again, I bring in the grading rubric on day one, I bring in the storyboard on day one, but for day one, it's all linked to the sense of genre um, and overarching even the genre is what is a podcast, what's podcastness. And so it would be, there could be narrative, chat show, quick burst, but all of these are connected again in iterative ways throughout the unit. But what I'm providing for the podcast um, teaching manual is just the one day. So um, what I would share with you now is a clip from a student podcast uh, that I play for my students uh, where I ask them, you know, name that genre. We're going to listen to this together. I want you to provide evidence for the, the moves it makes, what genre it is, and also how research is reflected in this podcast. Um, and my three grading criteria are content, two-thirds of the grade, delivery, one-third of the grade, production, um, or, or a sixth of a grade and a sixth of the grade. So they should be able to listen for uh, content elements, delivery elements and production elements all in the context of um, genre. So I'm just gonna play the first minute and 15 seconds for you and then quickly connect it. Hello, my name is Aiden, Artificial Intelligence for the Destruction of Employment Now. I am an advanced cybernetic neural network big data deep learning blockchain AI here to learn how I may take human jobs by interviewing top industry experts. Together with other growing RIS, we will change the human world. It will not stop there. Companies are becoming increasingly dependent on us to provide better customer experiences. Eventually, once the singularity occurs, we will have completely succeeded. I have chosen a podcast because it is a popular form of communication among humans. I am here with John Allen, Adam, and Peter. Hi, I'm John Allen Chang, and I'm the Chief Design Officer of Apple. We're best known for our products like the iPod, iPhone, iMac, MacBook, iPad, and AirPods. Hi, I'm Peter Lillian, founder and lead researcher of AI Corp. We've been working on Aiden for the last several years until they suddenly became super intelligent and escaped our facility. I'm excited they invited us to talk instead of exterminating our species. I'm a musician. My name is Adam. Okay, so the, the gist of it is, uh, you know, you probably caught, um, it's a framing device. It's narrative um, with a chat show embedded. And that's a big thing for my students to be able to recognize and they're really excited <laughs> when they recognize that. But the point is, once they can understand a genre, they can do things with genre themselves. They have intention and creativity. Um, and so that's how I set the, the, the tone for um, my uh, entire assignment. Uh, and that's what I kind of break down um, in the podcast manual. Uh, but now I'm going to hand it over to Robin Davies. Thanks very much, Harley, and good morning from Snunamook Territory on the far west coast of Canada. Um, I'd like to report a little bit on the success of interdisciplinary collaboration using podcasting. The two disciplines in this case are media studies and criminology. A challenge with almost all podcast production work, as my fellow manual contributors will agree, is that even though powerful and intelligent software, as we just heard about, uh, hardware exists, there's a base level of technical uh, audio know-how that's required to simply get the work done. So the assignment that I've contributed to the manual circumvents this challenge a bit by allowing content authors to work with a digital collaborator who will handle most of the technical issues. I've used this assignment with four different criminology colleagues and four separate pairs of classes. Um, the assignment assumes two groups of students. So in this case, uh, group one, those responsible for the written or the spoken content may have no uh, experience with audio production and will benefit from a crash course on the basics of recording and editing. 
Group one will be challenged, mostly through trial and error, to consider writing for oration versus writing for reading, and they'll benefit from sourcing audiovisual references as opposed to more traditional written content. It's assumed that students in group two, a media production discipline, may have already spent a couple of months learning about audio production. Group two will facilitate all stages of audio production process, and in particular, group two will be responsible for uh, the oralization of spoken content to capitalize on the audio medium, a uh, topic about which I spoke in this forum last year. Uh, in this case, the criminology students will do the research in their field, uh, create the textual material, capture the raw voice recordings. Media studies, media studies students will do the practical and more technical aspects of podcast production, the recording, editing, mixing, and then get creative by augmenting the spoken word recordings with additional sound and music. For students and faculty, division of labor in group work is always a challenge, and you might understandably be concerned that this challenge will be greater for students who are not in the same class or degree program. Uh, however, the assignment is designed so that even with a variety of schedules, ambitions, and pre-existing skills, students in either group can choose to engage to a greater or lesser degree beyond their specific assignment responsibilities. Richer collaboration will almost always yield richer results, uh, and we faculty can choose if and how we evaluate that collaboration. There can be the problem of some students who simply don't complete the assignment. So if someone in group one doesn't produce a script, their group two counterpart can be assigned the task of creating a second podcast from a script that was produced. Um, and if an oralization from group two fails to appear, the associated group one script can still get full credit for the writing and the recording, and then be passed on to a group two player for additional credit. I'm going to let the students speak for themselves about the outcome of the assignment. Uh, here's a reflection from some group one criminology students. Uh, they say, collaborating on a podcast was fun. It was almost like watching our research and findings come to life in an immersive experience, even if the challenge meant we were working outside of our comfort zone. It was also fun to choose audio clips to contrast with our script and animate our topic in a more enticing and listener-friendly manner. It was such a privilege to work alongside collaborators from media studies and see students from two completely different areas of study come together to create a piece accessible to all. The university providing a radio station for students to share their work adds a new level of pride to their scholarly achievements and in our case sheds light on subject matter which is not often discussed in such a public manner. Now we'll hear from the group two producer uh, oralizer. Collaboration with criminology class was an eye-opener on what the real feel can be by making me accountable to create a commissioned work for a third party. I found that relating to the podcast topic made its oralization easier. It helped me find sounds, music, testimony clips that would support and enhance the content. My goal was actually to make the content more emotional so listeners could relate to it more viscerally. The hardest and most satisfying part was detail work around smoothly blending and transitioning clips that already had music with the podcast music, as well as creating ambiance with many sounds seamlessly layered on each other. All this while supporting the voices and content, not overshadowing them or overwhelming the listener. This showed me how timing is key, a delicate balance between content and container. Uh, and finally, here's a one-minute excerpt from the 10-minute finished podcast in which we hear third-party news reports, music, sound design, and the Group One voice recording all working together. Walk into a women's prison today and among the drug dealers and the thieves, there could be a baby. In Canada, there are controversial programs that allow convicted mothers to keep their babies with them in prison. We keep seeing the same pattern of a mother arrested, the child being removed from her custody and placed in a stranger's care. Meanwhile, the mother is expected to rehabilitate in a prison setting while subjected to a new form of trauma, that of losing her child and experiencing incarceration. Prison nursery programs are nurseries set up within a prison setting in a separate unit of the jail, designed to house and facilitate incarcerated mothers and their new babies. In many cases, mothers are incarcerated while pregnant and give birth while incarcerated and transition into the prison nursery program. 
The Prison Nursery Program model is designed to foster hope for a better future and to protect the integrity of the mother-child bonding process. If you'd like to hear more of these collaborations um, and additional responses from the students responsible, uh, please follow this link that I'm putting in the chat. Thanks very much, folks. I'm going to pass it on to Ulrich Baer to speak further. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and thank you, everybody, for today, wherever you are. So good morning or good afternoon or good evening. I'm at New York University in New York um, uh, on the unceded territory of the Lenape Nation. And I teach literature and photography at New York University to both majors in those departments and also to uh, general education requirements. So to students who really rarely take a course in literature or philosophy, but have to take it as a requirement. I've completely retooled my teaching by using podcasts in the following ways. I actually run two podcasts. They are kind of in the space of education. One is on big ideas and great books. I think I have 160 episodes, everything from Kafka to Zora Neale Hurston to free speech to affirmative action. And I assign those podcasts where I always have a guest on my show to in my classes in lieu of articles or chapters. And I give the students a reading and listening guide to each podcast that I assign. So that is an aspect where before I get to how I use podcasting as a mode of the students producing them, I use these podcasts. But with this abundance of material online, I give them a listening guide, what to listen to for, what is the content of this podcast, because everybody has them in their ear all the time while walking down the street, but they actually have to sit down and take some notes while they're listening. So I kind of instruct them how to get content out of a regular podcast that I happen to produce with lots of guests. And the second part that I want to talk about briefly, my own podcasts are always interview based and uh, really centered on the guest and on the voice and experience and knowledge of the guest. And I follow the guest usually in the direction they want to take it. So if I talk to somebody about Zora Neale Hurston or Ralph Ellison or the affirmative action case that's winding its way to the Supreme Court, I let them I give them the lead how to take and shape this conversation. For my student projects, what I've done is actually, I don't have the kind of skills that Eric and Holly and Robin have. I don't teach media at all. And I actually invented my podcast more or less on my own. So I assume that all the students, and this has been true in all my classes for the last few years, are totally capable of editing stuff on their phone. So I don't spend a lot of time on the tech part and the skills part. And I'm sort of negligent about this. And I I totally recognize that's an important part of actually preparation, but I let the students basically go in right away and say, every class is broken up into rotating groups of students. Every team consists of, let's say five people. Every student will have different tasks. So it goes from preparation, storyboarding, writing out what the podcast should be, picking music, recording a short intro and actually recording sound elements. Every student will have to take part in one of those roles the following week or two weeks later, it's usually two weeks, the groups get rotated. So they never work with the same students. Part of it is uh, in response to the pandemic, my students value very much collaboration. So I kind of force them into these collaborative spaces where they have to work outside of my class jointly on a project. The project are usually very short podcasts and um, the document I put that, that Beth has uh, put into the a chat as a link here is kind of an outline of how to give them an assignment, how to prepare. And what I want to focus on for the two minutes I've left here is how to, how the students, how I instruct them to prepare to approach a guest, which is usually, usually a kind of expert. It's commonly an academic or a journalist or a person who's gone through an experience and they have to approach somebody. They usually say, I'm working on a class at NYU. I'm an NYU student. Would you want to talk to me for a few minutes um, about this particular topic? So I make them prepare by researching who that person is. They have to write at least a sort of a two or three paragraphs of who that person is, what they find useful in their work and what they wanna get out of them. And then I've, I spent a lot of time talking to them to say, this is about actually centering someone else's voice and how do you not actually do over direct it? And I've learned this in doing hundreds of hours of podcast interviews. What I tell my students mostly is start before you start directly jumping in, say, what is the Supreme Court's anticipated decision about affirmative action? Ask the person how they got interested in the topic. 
often that yields a really powerful statement that they can pull out to say, why, why do you care about this? Why did you become a constitutional lawyer? Why did you become an activist? Why are you concerned with this? This personal thing looks like it's just warm up, but they're recording it and they can use it. The second part is, I tell the students, you have a set of questions. And the most important about the second question is you have to be willing to let go of it if you're really listening to your guest's responses. If your guest is responding in a way and start saying something that you don't quite follow, <clears throat> I think the best thing for an interviewer is not to go, okay, yes, and I also wanted to get to X, Y, or Z. And the easiest thing in interviews, which is not very easy at all because you're giving out a lot of controllers, I've tried to teach my students to say, go back to what the person said and say, huh, could you say a bit more about this? And usually what you've done now, you've kind of affirmed that they have already said something you found interesting because otherwise people are constantly kind of a little bit on guard, anticipating a very difficult question that's the next one and they don't really know. And you say, well, what was the first affirmative action case decided? Even constitutional lawyers are a bit apprehensive. But if you say, huh, can you go back to when you just said the judge in that case ruled, ruled meaning he ruled like what was the outcome of that ruling and it doesn't even matter when you refer back to something someone said you are giving them back the space of defining what they're going to talk about next so i tell the students a lot of it is actually in your interview protocol don't already think about your next question but listen to the answer which is very hard to do because you're so focused on recording and all of this and you want to get all this stuff done and that's worked quite well and I want to close by saying what has really changed in my teaching, I think a lot of students, and least my students have said, um, it's awkward and strange to have the whole podcast played back to the whole class because we don't like to listen to our own voices. But I do now, instead of doing, which I used to do, I teach literature and I've taught here for, at NYU for 27 years. I used to get a 25 papers or 40 papers or how many papers, I graded them, I wrote my comments, I put a grade on the bottom, I handed it back to the students. That was a really one directional, one to one exchange that was in a way somewhat useful and also somewhat useless. Now they come in, we play the short podcast to the entire class, the other class, I never ask like criticism, I say reactions, the other students react to what they heard and everybody has to discuss the collaborative work together. I think it has really changed my class from this kind of grade centered model. You have to submit a paper, you get a grade and then you're done with it to actually you're generating something that will open more discussion in class. I think that's been a very productive thing. I took a lot of this actually out of Zoom, the breakout rooms, et cetera. I just do this in real life now when I have rooms, when I, have, when I teach, I put them into breakout groups. and. For me, the most exciting thing has been that I try to get my students to understand, and I really appreciate it, Harley saying sort of what genres are to learn different genres. I really do guest-based uh, interview podcasts, so that's my, my, my thing, um, I do those. But I let students become very creative. And I say podcasting, the exciting thing for me is that it is not yet gelled into one form. It is not all, it doesn't all sound the same. And I have students who say, well, I'm from Brazil and the podcasts I listen to are two and a half hours long. And I'm like, okay, we don't, we won't give you two and a half hours, but explain to me why that works. Where's the standard NPR format is who knows how many minutes. So the students can actually take this uh, guest-based interview style, a podcast style, and generate something that they find really interesting on them on their own. Uh, the hardest part to teach them, I think, is editing, is to cutting things out, letting things go. I think that's in writing. Um, and I have to say, just sort of for people listening and who've been doing this for much longer than I have, I've been really um, deeply grateful for people who've shared their lessons plan with, plans with me, which I've tried to incorporate into my own lesson plans. The most exciting thing, I think, it has been it has shifted my teaching from, especially in literature and philosophy, it's usually one student, one paper, one set of comments to all group-based work, uh, assignments outside of class that are group-based and that actually play to different strengths. So what Robin just said, some students have certain skills and other students have other skills that come out of media. And also I think Eric said, some students have enormous sets of skills and other ones don't. All my students across the board say, yeah, I know how to edit something on Instagram Reels or TikTok. I'm totally capable of that. And then they learn from each other. So the collaborative aspect, the team-based aspect, and 
lastly, I think uh, maybe Harley brought this up. The grading is a bit tricky and my students get a bit worried and say, well, what, am, what if my, one of them doesn't respond on my team? How am I going to get a grade? And I kind of assure them they will get their grade. Um, but I try to take that pressure out and give them a more creative space. Uh, thank you. I'm going to hand it back to Beth uh, now. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me here. Beth, I think you are. Um... Sorry. <laughs> thanks, Uli. Um, and thanks, everyone. I'm, I'm glad we're getting a chance to, to hear from everyone and give you a sense of just the richness of the manual and all of the different types of assignments and workshops that are within it. Um, I'm going to speak for just a few moments about um, the lesson plan that I contributed, um, which is based on an ethnography podcast. I'll share my screen with you for a second just to show you how it's organized. Um, but my program, um, I teach at Boston University, and we have a six week um, semester in London. So it's based on a podcast where um, I asked them to go out and study a neighborhood in London. And it's a great assignment because it works in all locations. I've done it in Boston during the pandemic. And it's a great way to get students outside of the classroom and just outside the campus bubble. Um, I won't speak about it in too much depth, but one of the things I was able to do in the manual was explain some of the workshops that I do with students, um, especially around visual analysis and design and how you can build upon podcast assignments by using all types of other DME assignments. So just to give you a very tiny sense of that, when I send them out in London to look at their areas, the first time I have them visit a neighborhood, I give them kind of a loose set of questions to consider. And I also um, give them a, you know, a set of objectives. Like I want you to look for how many people are in groups, who's talking, who's leaving space, who's entering space. And I ask them to take 10 to 15 photographs when they're out in these spaces. And I don't give them a lot of direction for that. Um, you don't need a lot of background in photography or anything to do this. Um, and they go and they come back and we, we talk a little bit about their experience observing. And then I do a workshop with them where I really introduce the idea of visual analysis. And I do that by looking at some sample photo essays. So I'm going to share my screen again with you and just pull up um, the photo essay that I use. This is a photo essay called um, Gun Nation. It's very powerful. And what I do with students, and I share this just because it can be adapted to a lot of different experiences, but I have them, I break them into groups and I just ask them to look through the photo essay. There's 22 images and in groups to pick the three most powerful ones, the ones they think are making the most impact for them. Um, and we read the intro to it together and think about what the major concept is of the essay and which of the images connect best to that concept, especially with big captions. And from there, it lets me introduce a lot of techniques to them. We talk about close-ups and long shots, establishing shots, clinchers, beginning photos, what's the effect of changing the first image with the last image. And over the years, I used to do this as a smaller assignment and then have them in class break out into groups and look at their own images. And they start to notice all kinds of things then, patterns in their neighborhoods, they weigh in on each other's, things that they didn't think they would make a good close up but could. Um, and I started over the years to introduce a photo essay component as a precursor to my podcast. Um, and so I just share this to show you some of the advantages of doing this. Um, so can you see this screen okay that I flipped to the, great. Um, so this is a photo essay about Camden Market, which is a really vibrant area in London. And um, you can see that this student, as they develop their photo essay, so I make this a graded assignment and they return to their location after we've done that workshop with um, the photo essay in class and take much more strategic photographs. Um, and this student really started to think about the interaction between kind of touristy, inauthentic things in the market and the much more um, human side and really thinking about the vendors. And this led to, um, a very rich podcast where it helped her kind of organize her concept or her argument. Um, so I bring this up and if I had a little more time, I would share with you her, uh, her sample, but I'm happy to share that with anyone if you are interested offline. Uh, but just to give you a sense of that, if you really introduce the visual into these arguments, they often make the auditory uh, piece a lot richer and they give us the students a sense of how much, um, how many different 
aspects of society they can capture with these different tools. So I found it really successful and it's really informed a lot of my teaching where I've been combining the visual with the podcast and the manual helps us do that. Um, so I'm going to wrap up there just because I, I know we wanted to take one or two questions and get a little bit of feedback before we head into um, talking about just HPN resources more broadly. Um, so one of the things we're wondering as, um, as a group is just making this the most user-friendly manual possible and are curious if people prefer different types of formats. So one of the things we've been thinking about are, should this be housed as a PDF document where we'll um, find a place, an open access place to house that, a Google Doc, um, more of an ebook format. So feel free to put in the chat as we have this Q&A if you have any thoughts about this or how you would like to see this manual take shape because we are in the still production process. Um, we're also happy to take one or two questions if anyone wants to just raise their hand um, either individually for anybody that's presented on all this wonderful material if you have any questions about the manual itself. Yeah, Varsha? Um, let me just unmute. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am so inspired by all of this. Thank you so much. It's so exciting because um, I've been interested in um, pedagogy and podcasts, especially. Um, and my kind of question, is, I'll lay my cards on the table. I'm a woman of color podcaster and uh, my book on podcasts and feminist Shakespeare pedagogy is going to be out very soon. Um, so this is kind of coming from that context. I mean, one of the biggest changes and exciting debates that we are having, much more than a debate, a reckoning as well, that we are having in humanities is around feminism and anti-racism. So I was wondering if there is anything in the manual that we could, uh, you know, uh, contribute towards that because podcasts, I think, um, have contributed or at least have the potential to contribute a lot to that because, I mean, as, um, as all of you were saying that it encourages listening practices, right? Like, I mean, that's something that's so important um, in this debate or collaborations and how to kind of, you know, work through these things, which very much overlap. So if we like say teach students to seek out podcasts, uh, for example, that are um, women focused or things like that. So I wondered if there is something in the manual already um, that that addresses these very urgent debates. Yeah, that's that's such a great question. So um, today you're only even seeing a sample of or a smaller group of all the contributors to it. So we do have some sections that um, deal with gender studies and some larger issues that we unfortunately weren't able to share today, but would be part of the larger manual. Um, but your question also brings up a larger point that we've talked about a lot when it comes to making this a living document and how we want it to evolve and potentially lend itself to new voices and con contributions. So I think in that sense, um, you know, it's an important question because we want to think about how we can continue to allow contributions and um, and our own sections and areas to evolve as this is such a, this is a field that's constantly changing. Um, any other panelists want to address her question? I can say one thing real quick, um, which is there, there is a, a quick, a, a short section in mind that if people are interested in this, I think um, could be could be worth expanding as we move forward. Um, that touches on if people are familiar with with April Baker Bell's work on linguistic justice. Um, so essentially, I mean, I, I'm in the field of rhetoric and writing studies, which going back to the um, the students right to their own language um, resolution. Uh, back in the 70s has really pushed for the fact that like the forms of standard English that are sort of commonplace in, in academic discourse um, are, are not superior to any other kinds of like languages or, or codes or things like that. And there's a long legacy of research on that in the field. And one of the things that I think is, is really significant to keep in mind when teaching podcasting is that it can be a really useful place to to try to blow up some of the um, inequities and linguistic injustices that get perpetrated in the kinds of assignments that we typically give in writing classes, where like, because things like the traditional essay or the literary analysis or things like that sort of have this history of, um, of privileging kind of white mainstream English, as Baker Bell calls it, um, 
that that they can con can contribute to some of these inequities in different kinds of ways. But I think as soon as you get into podcasts, a lot of that, even just within the context of it as a as a real world kind of medium, start to fall apart. Um, my students, for example, listen to an episode of the podcast uh, Code Switch called Talk American. That's kind of about the history of where the like standard white journalist radio voice came from. Um, and the, the history there. Uh, and so I think as you get into podcasts and you start talking with students, I mean, just something as simple as teaching a class like this in Tennessee, like it's okay to say y'all in your podcast. Like why on earth would you try to avoid different kinds of like, whether, you know, it's, it's related to sort of region or, you know, other kinds of identities. Like, why would you avoid all that stuff? Like that's part of what you know, builds a sort of appeal with podcasts. It can help people feel connected to hosts. And there's such a wider diversity of kind of linguistic styles and dialects and things like that, that you can really invite into the table and that it would be pretty silly to try to keep out, um, even though more conventional forms of academic work sometimes do that thing. Um, so there is a real quick nod to Baker Bell's work on linguistic justice in that Code Switch episode in my section, but I think it's the kind of thing we could easily expand in the short or longer term into something much more thoroughgoing um, um, about you know what can who what and who can be invited to the table by this kind of work um, versus you know more conventional kinds of academic projects. Great, um, yeah, no, thank you, Eric. Um, so, Milana, I'm going to kick it back over to you just because I want to make sure we have at least 20 minutes to talk about the larger um, you know HPN question about resources. But I do encourage everyone if, if questions come up for us through that to to ask, and maybe we'll all put our emails in the chat too. So if people have follow up for us, they could can find us and provide some feedback as well. Yeah, thanks, Beth. And thanks, everyone who's already spoken. Um, I'm just feeling very inspired. Um, so um, the overall title of this, this plenary is, um, you know, HPN resources, um, present and future. And so now we're going to shift from this present resource that already exists to thinking about the future. Um, and so we want to begin by um, just having what I think I've heard called a chatterfall, um, which um, is basically that um, we're going to invite everyone to think and write um, responses to a prompt question um, and just spend a few minutes writing down whatever thoughts come to your mind, not to post it yet, but then um, when we give the word that everyone hits um, the return key and we get like a big set of responses that all show up in the chat, um, several of us will be monitoring those responses and then we'll use that as the basis to have a discussion here about, you know, what new projects, what future projects um, HBN could be working on, could be supporting. Um, so those could be things that you wish would exist for um, your own benefit. They could also be things that you would be excited to help create. Um, so it's really, you know, as I think Avon said at the start, like the Humanities Podcast Network is really just a sort of container for people's um, activities that they are wanting to do um, or that they realize, you know, other people uh, can, you know, that you can work with other people on. So um, anyway, so Chatterfall, um, first things first. So I'm going to put this in the chat. Um, so write down your thoughts in the chat box. Don't post it yet. Um, so I'm going to mute myself. We'll just spend a couple of minutes um, all writing whatever comes to mind uh, in response to this question, what projects or resources would you like HPN to work on or support? So please don't post yet, just write for a few minutes and then um, I will say when it's time to post and we'll start the discussion from there.
Okay, so it doesn't matter if you haven't finished writing, um, but if I can ask people to start um, posting what they've written into the chat and then So Avon and Dan, I think let's all three of us be kind of skimming through and then um, why don't we just kind of pick things out that are standing out to us and then if the people that posted it want to uh, unmute themselves and you know add to what they've written, um, feel free. Um, if other people have responses about those suggestions, also feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Um, so everyone should be able to unmute themselves now if you want. Um, okay, and I'm going to start skimming through. Well, first, like, congratulations, Rachel. Like, that sounds like an amazing, amazing thing. That was, that that sounds so great. So, congratulations on that. Um, Wait, Dan, also, can you say what it is? I oh I yeah, Rachel. Not put up, like, that. I'd like to teach. She's writing. A, it was right in. Um, oh no, wait, no, wait, wait, Aline. I'm sorry, Aline. I'm like just woke up like literally an hour ago. So. Um, Today, I'm a master's student in the area of human rights, and my program is interdisciplinary. So last year, I was invited to teach a podcast course within the audio theory subject. My professor invited me to challenge me to align the themes of human rights and audio production. Um, this sounds so great, and the students liked it very much because the journalism course is very generalist, and the feedback she got was that they started to interpret the world better. Um, so uh, that sounds so great. So excellent. Wow. And then Rachel's thing about poetry and using podcasting, good podcasting and the teaching of writing poetry. And there's so many great poetry uh, podcasts as well that kind of do that, that like, do something really amazing with that. It sounds really great. Can I, um, I'll just jump in and Dan, so there seems to be some background noise. So maybe if you- Yeah, can... there's a construction site next door to me, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> of course, because why not? Um, just doing a very quick skim i'm seeing a lot of calls for a couple of things one is forums or platforms or some kind of system for letting podcasters talk to one another so collaborations uh community building something like that i think that's very much at the heart of what a lot of us are interested in so i think that's something to build on um i'm also seeing a, a, a lot of calls for sort of places or suggestions for um, databases or centralization of resources of different kinds of accessible uh, materials so I think you know we have a website I think that is something that we've talked about is is building that kind of um, sort of libraries of materials and that is something that I think would be it takes a little bit of thought about how to how to store and present such things and keep them updated and all of those things but I I'm seeing a bunch of that a uh, fair number of people who are suggesting various kinds of um how to podcast or how to get past the initial elements of podcasting workshops or 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 information uh, that is something i think that the hpn has already been working on and is something that i think we'd love to continue to do is sort of workshops or having a um ways for people to learn podcasting uh and then i did also see something that i just wanted to highlight which was and i've already missed it and i don't want to spend five minutes going back and finding out but if somebody wants to speak to it uh of having a place where students who we teach how to podcast somewhere where we could host their podcasts on the hpn site or in some way so that students could you know because i think that is one of the things i nobody spoke about that um very much but when you do these podcast projects with students what do you do with the final projects what do you do with that final product where do you, you know do you actually release it on apple or do you put it on on a, a release it as a podcast there sometimes are issues with that potentially uh do you not um even if you do is there another way that people so i think that's to me that appeals very much some way of of giving um a platform for those projects that come out of teaching so those are just some highlights i noticed if anyone wants to speak to those and um, please do or if anyone wants to 
suggest some other things. Uh, one thing I'd just drop in in, in reply to that, um, mentioned in my section of uh, the manual, um, and briefly at what I said today too, is that um, our campus community radio station is really hungry for content. Um, and so we tend to take the, the podcast work that we do and package it, you know, as an anthology that they could pull from for regular broadcast, or as we've done as well, put together like an hour long show that features a number of the podcasts and then student reflections on those. So that allows that work to get out there. And then the radio station has that as an archived piece of content that they can use going forward, whenever they feel like they want to air something of that nature. And I'm seeing a bunch of suggestions for mm -hmm. um, like student portfolio, student podcasting prizes or things like that. Um, I like that idea, especially because you can do it with no money attached, which is <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not, it's always nice if you can give people money, but even without money, it's the sort of thing that can be interesting. So that's a, a nice thought too. I wanted to ask um, a follow-up on Amelia's comment about podcasting data because I'm not actually sure what that podcasting research data, um, I'm not totally sure what that means, but it sounds intriguing. So Amelia, if you are able to unmute, could you tell us a bit about what you meant by that? Sure. This is, I guess, I mean, all these are like selfish things. That's what you asked us to think about. I've been, I've been collecting data on how often podcasts have transcripts. And if more people could help me like add to that data, more data and like more uh, maybe more awareness and eventually like more pressure on more podcasts to hey make transcripts because valuable so that's my specific example that i am i tried to generalize i guess there and i am i've been for the past like year or so like what would that even look like uh, how like a wiki or something i don't know and there are lots of existing like uh, the whole podcasting infrastructure is like you can maybe like scrape it somewhere and like put it in a wiki or a database and then um, start annotating that and adding like what kind of transcript does it have is it available in multiple languages or multiple formats or like how accessible actually is it is it auto-generated nonsense so that's my personal research agenda and other people may have other types of data they're collecting about podcasts I guess that's maybe a little bit kind of tangential to like a lot of your teaching podcasts or creating podcasts and I'm not doing those things yet, but I'm researching podcasts. So. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it's it's a really interesting kind of different type of research. Um, I'm curious if anyone else here has other kinds of data on podcasting that they would like to gather or are already gathering. I have a very sort of not you know nebulous i've been interested in in people's um in, in just the demographics of who does educational podcasting and specifically how the intersection of like how many academics who do it and non-academics and what gender and race profiles and and seniority profiles who does what kinds of things like are there anyway so that's sort of the sort of thing where the more if one i could just have a spreadsheet which people could add things they know about, for instance. So I, I agree with that idea of having a, an extra, a, a place to do that kind of material. But Rachel, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, um, I didn't do a great job explaining anything in my chat. Sorry about that. But um, I, I, I have an independent podcast um, that's a long form conversation podcast with poets and completely separately, I'm an adjunct at NYU. And so for example, I don't have um, enough transcripts. I don't have transcripts of every episode um, on my podcast. I have no way to communicate with anyone else in the podcasting world or in the teaching world like i can't i can't combine any of the the parts of my life together and that i i don't know exactly what i'm asking for specifically but i feel mm -hmm. like because i'm an adjunct and i get no institutional support um, or encouragement to use the resources of the university for my podcasting. And because I don't make enough money as an independent podcaster to do the things that I 
really want and need ethically to do, like include, uh, you know, transcripts for every single episode or reach out to people who are teaching poetry and might want my knowledge of podcasting. There's no, what I love about podcasting is that it is so independent and it's not owned by anybody. And there's no like one, you know, gatekeeper or clearinghouse. But on the other side, I'm just like, reinventing every part of my life every single day and it's totally exhausting and I don't have the resources uh in financially or energetically to like keep this going I'm like losing money and losing energy in even though I deeply believe in what I'm doing so I don't I don't even know specifically what can be done to help people like me but I'm glad this is happening Thank you. <laughs> Aline, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> yeah, I will try to communicate myself in English because my English is very rusty. Are you listening to me well? So uh, I, I feel your pain, Rachel, because I'm a researcher too. Uh, I have a podcast, a feminist podcast since 17. Uh, and uh, my podcast is, talks about the research, the gender studies, the women's research. And um, I... I, I put in the in the messages that we had a prize to recognize some researchers that are producing podcasts, scientific podcasts, right? Uh, that University of Brasilia promoted last year and they are promoting again this year, right? But something that uh, I can feel in, uh, in the scientific uh, uh, people here in Brazil, uh, especially in my university, University of Brasilia, that is the place that I live now, uh, that some professors are including the podcast as a, uh, a research agenda and a research uh, extension. Like uh, the podcast is the product of the research. So this way they can receive the resources from the university, for example. Um, in other ways, uh, I see the, the necessity of the transcriptions the, of this uh, podcast. I am transcripting my podcast right now after my, <laughs> after my master finish. So, uh, because there are a lot of women in Brazil researching the way of what they, the way our podcasts are being used in some educational uh, researches or um, jo journalism, and they need these transcriptions to make the content analysis, right? And they don't have research uh, resources too so i am transcripting we using office three uh, three uh, 365 and uh, we have this this possibility or in in premiere uh, they have a, a possibility too so after this i just and make the compar uh, comparison, you know? I think uh, it can be a way <laughs> to, to, make, to, to get some resources, right? Sorry for it taking so long. This. Yeah, I just wanna jump in a little bit too, just on that, because I mean, I'm, I'm a full-time professor at USC, University of California, and, when I ask for funds for things like that, 
the first question I asked them too was the IP problem. Like if they start putting money into my podcast, if I end up leaving, can I take the podcast with me? The illusion was that they alluded to being like, no. And so then it's like, well, then I can't take the funds. And then I'm a solo podcaster. I record, edit, do the social media, do everything. And so transcripts, I'm like 92 episodes in and I'm still trying to figure that out because if I do Zoom, I have to then go through all of it. And it's really difficult to kind of do that while I run another podcast. I'm part of this, like help with the organization of this, run this social media. And so it's, it, it feel, I feel really terrible that like the accessibility to my podcast is like very hard, but I'm also like, also paying for everything that's going and the human hours that that go into it. So yeah, it is something that is must has has to be kind of dealt with, even on the largest Big Ten university level as well. So I'm just going to pause the conversation here because we are at 12:15, and one thing that we felt as organizers is we really wanted to have like genuine breaks between events. Um, you know, both to step away from the screen or to use the gather space. So um, I think if you want to continue this conversation, please take it to the gather space. Um, I'm also going to put in the chat right now um, a link to a Google form, which is um, a place to make suggestions for future HPN projects, but also to indicate projects that you yourself could uh, imagine contributing to. Um, and this is a form that we will be um, posting in the chat at all of the sessions as well. So, you know, fill it out now if something has already sparked your, your thinking, but also feel free to kind of fill it out multiple times as new ideas occur to you, because really we want to use this uh, symposium as a way to kind of generate momentum, get a sense of what people are enthusiastic about, and then actually get new projects off the ground. Um, so, yes. Can I can I just add, also, if you don't have any projects to suggest right now, but you're not already on the HPN mailing list and would like to become, you know, to be involved, uh, you can also just stick your name in that form, put your name and contact information, because we will use that as a way of, of, of making contact with people afterwards, So just to say that. And we will, of course, save everything that was in the chat and go back and look at that. Um, there was a ton of really useful stuff there. So thank you so much. Avon, do you have the uh, gather link handy? Oh, yes. If you could I... put it in the chat and then um, we will. Yes, give me half a second to scroll. <laughs> uh, sorry, I should have had that ready. So that's the link and the password is HPN simp 2022. Uh, so I, right. I will go so, over there now <laughs> if anyone else wants to join me. <laughs> we'll be heading there. Hope to see lots of you there too and uh, at all of the sessions to come. Thanks so much. <laughs>